Well, let's check in with the governor. Set the stage a little and then we'll have some very interesting uh, remarks and details by Dr. Toomey and Dr. Duvey. But uh, this is a part of our effort to be sure that the people of the state are informed. As you know, when this virus hit, the virus w was chasing us, but now we are turning the tables and we are chasing the virus. And we have a, a plan of testing, of contact tracing and testing that is superior and uh, we know that it will be effective. It is statewide, it is comprehensive, it is smart, and it will work. It has many components. There's a lot of collaboration and cooperation that has gone into this. And of course, the, the, the supplies and many of the materials that we'll be using, including the reagent for testing, and those things are coming at the at the insistence with the help of the Trump administration that has been with us every step of the way. We have conference calls, as you know, on a regular basis. I do, Dr. Toomey does, and others as well, Dr. Duvey. And we do not believe that we are going to run out of testing materials. We also don't think that we're going to run out of protective, personal protective equipment. We, we may get short every now and then, but we, we go the supplies are being, the, the supply chains are being set and the manufacturers, a number have shifted over into making these supplies, including some of them right here in South Carolina. So we're, we're in a good position uh, to do this. Again, contact tracing is essential at this stage. We now know what the disease looks like. We know its capacity. We know it is vigorous. It is highly contagious. And among some people, including those with underlying con physical conditions, as well as age, and the combination of those two makes it even more deadly, which uh, puts a target on our nursing homes and our elderly communities and uh, those who are in impoverished areas, and including a number of our minority communities. So we're, we're going to be testing all over South Carolina. And you'll be able to see, as you can now, on the DHEC website exactly where that testing is going on. And it, it costs nothing, and it, we will be plenty, plenty of testing. And we will uh, start with an introduction by Dr. Toomey, Rick Toomey, who's head of DHEC. And then we'll move forward with Dr. Duvey, and then we'll answer your questions. Thank you, Governor. As part of Accelerate South Carolina and working with the governor's office and the leadership of the General Assembly, we are focusing on a strategy to expand the numbers of testing for South Carolinians. The first part is starting with nursing homes. The second part is to reach more people across the state and this will be accomplished with extensive collaboration with the South Carolina Hospital Association, MUSE, Prisma, the federally qualified health care centers, and many others. DHEC cannot do it alone. It is key that our strategy is a component to overall plans being developed and discussed with the governor's office and in collaboration with the General Assembly as they return to Columbia next week. For more specific details about the nursing home uh, testing and the expansion where we are going to challenge ourselves to reach uh, a significant number of South Carolinians in both the months of May, I, let me turn it over to Dr. Joan Duvey. Thank you very much, Dr. Toomey, Governor. Um, I'm happy to be here today to talk um, about our testing initiative at DHEC. Um, as our nation and state continue to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic, Team South Carolina remains committed to protecting the health and safety of all South Carolinians. DHEC has developed a statewide representative testing program to gain a better understanding of infection prevalence among all South Carolinians. Testing helps us to quickly identify hotspots, to catch outbreaks before they spread, and it helps to indicate where we need to put our resources most. 
As of May 5th, a total of 68,766 tests have been performed in South Carolina, covering about 1.25% of our state's population. Of those tests, 6,841 have been positive for about a 10% positivity rate. In order to begin the safe transition back to our day-to-day -day quality of life and vibrant economy, South Carolina will need to increase per capita testing to allow for more precise public health interventions that will help reactivate our economy. To assist in this effort, the federal government has committed to provide DHEC with enough swabs and testing supplies to test 2% of South Carolina's population during the months of May and June. Through our testing plan, our goal is to test 2% of the population or 110,000 South Carolinians per month. Specifically, our plan focuses on four key testing areas. Universal testing of nursing home residents and staff, expanding testing in under-resourced minority and rural communities, conducting mass testing in urban areas, and finding additional testing sites. Approximately 40,000 South Carolinians live or work in the state's 194 nursing homes. While protection measures have been put in place, including the governor's executive order on March 13th that stopped public visitation to these types of facilities, the number of infections among staff and residents in long-term care facilities continues to grow. Unfortunately, the number of fatalities among long-term care facility residents is also growing. As of yesterday, 851 cases have been reported in these facilities, which equates to about 12% of all our COVID-19 cases in South Carolina. Meanwhile, there have been 84 COVID-19 associated deaths at these facilities, representing 28% of all those who have died from COVID-19 infection in our state. To help protect this vulnerable population, DHEC will conduct universal testing of all 40,000 South Carolina nursing home residents and staff. DHEC also will be increasing testing in other congregate facilities, such as prisons, jails, and group homes. As we enhance our testing cap capacity at our congregate facilities, we also recognize the importance of increasing access to testing across our state, especially for those at greatest risk for severe illness from this disease. African American and other minority populations have been disproportionately impacted by COVID-19 with higher per capita rates of serious illness and death than in white populations. African Americans represent 27% of the state's population, yet account for 44% of confirmed cases and 46% of the fatalities in coronavirus patients statewide. Likewise, our rural counties account for nine out of the 10 top counties for infection rates per capita. DHEC and the CDC conducted a gap analysis to identify county level gaps in COVID-19 testing in the non-institutionalized population across our state. We will use mobile testing sites, community paramedicine, and community healthcare and retail partners to increase testing capacity in these communities. We will also partner with the governor's office, the South Carolina legislature, the South Carolina Hospital Association, local business, and others to set up mobile testing clinics. In addition, urban areas are of concern because of their size, population density, and access to social venues where people congregate. Urban centers are also centers of tourism and commerce, welcoming domestic and international visitors. DHEC will work with partners to host pop-up testing events at multiple locations each month in Charleston, Columbia, and the Greenville-Spartansburg area. We want South Carolinians to know that DHEC is doing everything we can to stop the spread of COVID-19, and a key component of that is increasing our testing capacity. We will continue to provide the public with locations of COVID-19 sampling sites, including mobile and pop-up clinics. For the latest updates on COVID-19 and for information on testing site locations, you can visit scdhec.gov 
backslash COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Duby. So as we increase our testing and also will increase the tracing, or the, the contact tracing of those people who test positive, we will expect to see a lot more numbers of, of positive tests because we're doing many times more testing than we're doing now. But uh, this is, this is a, a large effort and it, we are confident that it will produce uh, results and help us contain this uh, virus and will enable us uh, to get back to work, which is the, we must do as quickly as possible. So this is a big step forward and there'll be more steps. Are there any questions? Yes, sir, Joe. Uh, Dr. Juve, why is two, testing 2% 2 of the population important? Why is that a key number? I'm not sure that there's anything magical about 2%. Um, it is about, um, well, more, it is almost twice as many tests as we have done since the beginning of the COVID-19 outbreak in South Carolina. Um, so it is a significant number. It is um, mainly determined by the testing capacity that we will have um, based on the supplies that will be sent by the federal government. If we're able, uh, with, the, with the assistance of our commercial labs and our clinical laboratories, um, we hope to exceed that. Also, there's a capacity of 11,700 tests that can be performed a day by the public lab and the private labs. We're reporting between 2,000 and 3,500 tests per day over the last week. What's, why aren't we at that capacity, the full capacity? What's holding us back? Um, I think that's a really important question. I think that um, there are several reasons we haven't met our testing capacity. One of those reasons has been um, the uh, uncertain supply of reagents and transport material. Um, so really, if we were to have um, established uh, an increased number of testing sites but couldn't deliver on the testing supplies, then we might fail to be able to do that when we have the testing supplies. People would start to wonder what's going on. Uh, I think that's one reason. I think the other reason is that the CDC guidelines for testing have now opened. They've opened wide, the door is open. Previously, the CDC recommended that only people with fever, cough, and shortness of breath get tested. Uh, what we were seeing was a lot of testing in emergency departments, in people who were hospitalized, and people who were sick enough to go to the doctor. What we really need to do now, and what the CDC has allowed us to do, has recommended that we do, is to increase testing to populations with milder symptoms people who might have a headache or a sore throat, um, maybe some nausea, maybe some diarrhea. Uh, there are m milder symptoms that people may not even recognize um, could mean they have a COVID-19 infection. And some people don't have any symptoms at all. What these testing sites will allow us to do is to capture those individuals with no symptoms or with mild symptoms. So we better understand the number of people who are infected in our state in an, and in our communities. Um, in addition, I'll just mention that um, there is literature that talks about the, um, the, the, the period of time during which individuals are most likely to infect other individuals. And it turns out that that period of time um, often occurs before people develop those serious symptoms that drive them to the emergency department or drive them to the hospital, which means that people who have mild symptoms who are out, uh, you know, in the community uh, amongst us um, may be actually transmitting disease more effectively than people who develop those serious symptoms of fever, cough, and shortness of breath. This idea yes, of contact tracing becoming more essential now, mm -hmm. is this something you guys have already been doing? Why is it so important now? Yeah. I just wonder if this is something that's already been done or? It is, it's something that we have been doing since day one and we have offered contact tracing services to every single South Carolinian who's been diagnosed with COVID-19. So it's not more important, it's as important. The, what is going to happen is that we will need more contact tracers as we begin to diagnose more individuals with COVID-19. And we want to have a rapid response, knowing that people quickly become infectious with this illness. We can't wait five days or seven days to start doing that contact tracing. So we're going to need an army of contact tracers to help us respond in, in, in short time to, um, to somebody who has a positive diagnosis. And how 
many contact tracers do you have now and how many do you need? I know you said an army. How many are we talking? Hundreds or? Yeah, so we have 230 contact tracers currently, um, which is 100 more than we had last week. Um, and we are in the process of identifying um, uh, another, uh, do the math, um, 780 for a total of 1,000 contact tracers. So we will identify individuals who are, are, are interested in assisting us. We have volunteer calls coming in from all around the state. How can we help you? Um, there is an online training module, which we will um, po post on our website for people who are interested. And they can take that training and they can learn how to do contact tracing. And we will maintain a database of those individuals. If we hired 780 additional contact tracers, that math is wrong, 770, um, now we, we wouldn't really have work for them to do, but we want to have them in our back pocket. So once these testing initiatives get rolled out and we start testing, we start getting increased numbers of, of positive um, individuals, like the governor said, we will have those contact tracers available to jump in and augment our contact tracing workforce. Uh, go, um, Dr. Duke, could you explain how contact tracing works? Oh, absolutely. So contact tracing is um, somebody who um, either calls on the phone or does a Skype visit with, uh, with somebody who's been identified to be positive for COVID-19. So they'll be in touch with that individual. They will um, walk the person through what the diagnosis means. They will assess the, the, the person for any needs they might have. For example, if it's an individual living at home who doesn't have access to food, they will link that person to resources in the community. Perhaps if it's an individual who um, doesn't have a primary care provider, they will make that link to services so the individual knows where to seek care if their symptoms get worse. Um, they will develop a relationship with the person. They'll explain that the person needs to be in isolation for 14 days. Um, and they'll explain why. They will ask about family members. Who have you been in contact with? Because we want to keep the people around you safe as well. And then they will reach out and talk to those individuals. They will talk to them about the importance of quarantining. Um, to for a period of time for 14 days to see if they were to develop symptoms or not and they would expand um, a testing outreach to those individuals as well they'll make frequent calls just to check in as well I mean it's a relationship that gets established you made references to nursing homes I want to make sure we're only talking nursing homes and not assisted living that's if right not why not right now um, the, the data that we have suggests that nursing homes um, are bearing uh, a, an undue burden of disease um, and death from COVID-19. So we really wanted to, to focus on those facilities. 40,000 people is a lot of people to test in short order. Um, we won't be doing them all at once. We'll be rolling this out in phases. Um, and we'll have completed this by the end of the month. Um, and we need to um, actually make sure that when, when the first group of nursing homes, when we're done with that testing, um, that our plan to assist with infection preventionists, um, with um, assessing, helping them assess PPE, um, with, with helping them understand um, how to cohort patients who've tested positive, um, and then working with the staff as well, we wanna make sure that that process goes smoothly. Uh, we will be planning um, while this is taking place, we will be planning testing um, in other congregate living facilities too. So not, yeah. In the back. Yes. Speaking about nursing homes, can you break down and release the number of staff versus patients' deaths at these nursing homes? Yes, I don't have, I don't have that data. I'm sorry. Is there a reason why you, you all can't do that yet? Or? Um, I, I just don't have the data available. I'm not sure if if we'll be reported. Nick, do you have an answer for that? Yeah. We will, we will be working to do that. Okay. So we will be working on getting that data available, making that data available, but it's not available yet. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Can you talk about rural testing and how that will work in areas where there aren't hospitals, mm -hmm. there aren't medical areas in, in those rural counties? So I can speak in general and then um, Nick, yeah, oh, sorry? Or me. Oh, would you like to speak? Sure. I'm going to turn it over to Director Toomey. 
So we had a pilot site yesterday in Society Hill um, and tested it, and I think we did 460, 463 tests, and that was, again, under the rubric of if you wanted to have a test, you were welcome to have a test, and it was a drive-through facility. So the question about how do we get into the rural communities is to, um, one, partner with a lot of organizations. And we have actually, through contacts and asking for information, identified 47 sites that are scheduled in the next month uh, across the state, and not just rural, but in some of the mes metropolitan areas as well. So through not only working with the FQHCs, the nursing home, I mean, sorry, the hospitals, uh, um, working with churches, working with schools, we will go and we'll partner with anyone and we'll provide the supplies for the testing site to expand the number. And so it won't be at a cost to the individual. So we're looking to partner with as many organizations or help any organization that wants to have a testing site done, completed, be it one day, two days, three days, we're there to help them. And on our website, and we're gonna link it to accelerate.sc.gov on one of their panels that you can click on it and find out where are the testing sites, not only by county, but we'll have a list underneath by date and by location so people can uh, be aware. Communicating it is going to be very important, and we'll communicate it the same way that we want to partner it with local churches, with the schools, with uh, businesses, with the legislative representatives of those areas, uh, with mayors. We have a lot of contacts in the community, being we have a uh, DHEC office in every county of the state. So we'll be re out reaching out to make sure people are aware of the access and the testing sites. Just, just to confirm. Let's go, go over here. Um, over the last couple of days, uh, the last couple of weeks, you've been saying that the curve has been flattening, or we're seeing a plateauing in, in cases. What, what chart says that? What graph says that the cases are plateauing? Um, so that is the testing data that we have, um, that which is the the way we identify people who have COVID nineteen infections. So we look at the number of tests. Um, I think currently on our website, the data reports the number of tests that we report out per day. Um, we also look at the number of tests by the date they were, the samples were taken. And we're beginning to look at the number of individuals um, on a daily basis by when they first reported symptoms. So we're looking at it in a lot of different ways. Um, and that is the data that we use to, to talk about um, you know, the curve flattening. So in other words, when the number of individuals who have been diagnosed with COVID-19 was continuing to increase, then we saw that curve increasing pretty steeply. But flattening means that we're not seeing an acceleration in diagnoses. What it doesn't mean is that we're seeing a decrease in diagnoses either. Is it the percentage yeah. that's coming back positive is that, that we're looking answer, at? Does that answer your question? I, I guess, is it the percentage of cases that are coming back positive? Is that a way of looking at a curve plateauing or flattening? Yeah, you, you could look at it that way as well. Um, but what we know is when we do targeted testing, we are going to have a higher percentage of cases that come back positive. In fact, it's interesting, the, the DHEC lab has a higher case positivity rate than the commercial labs um, that report to us. And what that says to me is that DHEC is doing a great job of providing testing in those communities where there is dis ongoing disease transmission. Yes, I just wanted to confirm that, th so this testing will be free, and, and if that's the case, where are the resources coming from to make that possible? So the testing supplies will be free, and those are coming from the federal government. Of course, there, there may be a cost to setting up a drive-through testing facility, um, and DHEC has received um, funding through the General Assembly. Um, here in South Carolina and also funding um, from the federal government and we will use those funds and work with partners to uh, to set up those testing sites and to run those testing clinics. Do you know how much it will cost to do the drive-through? How much it would cost somebody to I actually take no. the test? I, I, no, I, I, I don't. If we're asking people with mild symptoms to go get tested these days, 
if I've had a headache for two days, should I go and get a test now? Is that what we're encouraging? Or? That would be great. Yes, ma'am. Governor, if you can talk about the role of testing in your decisions going forward in terms of reopening the economy. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. What is the role or importance of testing in your decisions going forward? It's, it's very important because the, the testing is, as both doctors have said, the testing and then the, the uh, tracing of those contacts is very, very important because that, that's how we're going to control the the disease and we have to be very aggressive about it that's why we are expanding the testing and we'll be expanding the contact tracing the disease has been chasing us now we're chasing the disease and when someone gets it when they test positive we want to find out about it we want to isolate them find out who they whom they've been in contact with and we'll contact those people alert them to what's going on and we'll have a, a good bit of isolation and a lot of knowledge but that is, is, it is that knowledge that will enable, enable us to, to open up. Are we still encouraging people to wear masks in public and, and social distance? And how do you encourage them when, that, when the numbers, uh, you're seeing that you know, only 1.25% of the population has been tested? Well, I'm glad you asked that question because I was just thinking that I really need to reinforce that message. So. Um, just because we're increasing testing in our communities doesn't need that doesn't mean that we should stop the social distancing um, that we have been doing. It, will, it doesn't mean that we should stop thinking about hand hygiene. That we uh, we should still stay home when we're sick. And wearing a mask in public is is critically important for the reasons that I mentioned earlier. Because you don't know, it, you may not know if you're infected. You may not know if the person in front of you or next to you is infected. Um, so it is not only a way to protect yourself, but it's a way to protect those around you. Um, it's, a, it's a very selfless thing to do, actually, because you're thinking about everyone around you and taking care of them. And from my brief time in South Carolina, that's the sense I get that South Carolinians take care of each other. And also, um, just because we are removing some restrictions, that we have imposed does not mean that we're not still urging people to be careful to follow all those recommendations of social distancing and, and everything else. Yes, ma'am? Yeah, a recent article has identified different strains of the virus. Is there a specific strain that's more dominant here in South Carolina? So I am not familiar with that, but I will do some reading tonight. Um, from my understanding, I don't believe we've done the genetic testing on the virus that's circulating in South Carolina, um, but we are working closely with the CDC, and I know that that's something they're very interested in doing, um, so I'll run back and ask them as well. Thank you for that question. Yes. Governor, uh, when do you expect to have uh, your next uh, wave of reopenings, and what should we expect to be included in that next wave of reopenings? Well, we're being very careful. We hope to be able to announce something in maybe even before the, the week is out of some, some future dates. But that's a we're calculating and gathering information to make those decisions. We want to make them as quickly it, as soon as we can to reopen things or lift restrictions as soon as as early as soon as we can. But also it must be must be safe. Governor, yeah. What yes. What does it look like for enforcement? Of, Say again. What does it look like for enforcement to make sure that businesses are practicing social distancing, that they are keeping those tables spread apart, that people are doing what they're supposed to be doing? Well, the, the best regulator of that will be the businesses themselves and, and their customers, uh, because everyone knows now what the disease means, how it's spread, and those who would choose to violate the precautions that have been urged, who are not being good neighbors, uh, I'm sure we'll hear about it from the other neighbors and the customers. I think the marketplace will take care of a lot of that. But still, remember, in effect, uh, under in South Carolina, when the when the governor has issued a declaration of uh, emergency, that that automatically uh, activates uh, two things. One is the the law that provides a a misdemeanor penalty, a small penalty, but nevertheless a penalty for congregating in, in such a fashion or such a way and or in such numbers to threaten health or threaten the public uh, safety or other things. And that is still in, still in, in effect. The other one that is automatically uh, 
activated is the price gouging law, which goes, and that's still in effect too. That doesn't have an impact on this necessarily, but those are the two that automatically go into effect and, and they're still in effect. Yes, ma'am. When it comes to the mask, I'm getting questions from viewers. Uh, they want to know why you aren't wearing a mask whenever we see you in these press conferences. and, and Because this, the this is the only place I go is here in, in the emergency management division and home. If you see me somewhere else, it's somebody else. Last question. I had a quick question about public pools. A lot of them are waiting on guidance from DHEC to open up. Do you guys have any guidelines on that yet? Or are you discouraging them from opening up in South Carolina? I had a uh, discussion with uh, Myra Reese and our environmental affairs leader, uh, and she's working with Accelerate South Carolina and the uh, LLR and the Commerce, and they are actually putting together some best practices for that as we are talking, and they'll be, as they are doing with so many things, providing a best practices site on accelerate.sc.gov where businesses can go to uh, as a resource material. So we're actually working on that uh, information right now. Yes, ma'am. Governor, we had a situation at the West Columbia chicken plant today dealing with people that were protesting the safety measures there and, and wages. Can you just address what kind of safety guidelines you're giving to um, these meat processing plants? Well, the, the Centers for Disease Control has issued uh, those guidelines. Uh, they, are, they are comprehensive. That's Smith, Smithfield. House of Rayford, that is a, an excellent company. We're delighted to have them in South Carolina. Uh, I think we can depend on them. If there are any inadequacies, or, or I'm, I'm confident that they will react and, and react uh, as they should. 